All right, well, we had a technology breakdown in the other room, and so here we are about 10 minutes later trying to get set up in another room. Technology. You know, we've just made ourselves so vulnerable, vulnerable to, you know, terrorist attacks and uh, hackers from China and Russia uh, getting access to our financial and other information. I, I don't know. I think technology could, could be the end of us, certainly. Artificial intelligence, too. Yeah. Worry about that. Okay, so we gotta have a short in class eight. Uh, here's the two lectures. Uh, first lecture: review regression facts. Talk about parameters and statistics and sampling distributions some more, and introduce the idea of probability. Lecture B: get more into probability, probability models, simulation, and what are called discrete and continuous random variables. All right. Um, may need to zoom in. I don't know how bright that screen is here. I don't think I can make it any brighter, but. Let's quickly go over the facts of all these squares regression again. And what I want to focus on here today is number two, actually. Um, I, I have talked about this one before. Again, the, uh, I'll write on the board here, too, so you can go back and forth a little bit. The slope of the least squares linear regression line, our book gives you this formula for it. Uh, when you know the standard deviations of the x's and the y's, and you know the correlation coefficient, you can find the slope of the linear regression line with this equation. B1 is the slope. I want to remind you that you can think about slopes as rates of change, and so you can write down that kind of equation to say, if you allow x to change by a certain amount, this is the typical notation for that, delta x, that triangle is a Greek letter delta, that represents one quantity, the change in x, for example, x could increase by one unit, to find the corresponding change in y along the line, in this case along the regression line, multiply the slope times the change in x. And since this is the formula for the slope, you can replace the b1 with this thing, and write the equation like that. And it's a common thing in statistics to imagine what happens when x changes by one standard deviation for the x's. If delta x is s sub x, x increases by one of its standard deviations, these two things are going to imply the corresponding change in y along the regression line is r times sy over sx times replace delta x with s sub x, like that. And then do some canceling. You can cancel the standard deviation of the x's, and you're left with r times the standard deviation of y y changes by r of its standard deviations along the regression line when x changes by 1 of its standard deviations. And that was a point I tried to bring out in the last class. Let me re-emphasize the meaning of it here. Uh, we looked at it right here for one thing. I'll zoom in real close, I think, to this picture. It's a little, again, not real bright. Do your best to squint if you need to. Uh, so here we have data about the sun's height um, as a response variable to the father's height as the explanatory variable. This is the data that Galton uh, collected. It's a cloud of data, oval type of shape. The red line is called the SD line. That says SD line that you can barely make out there. Um, that really seems more like the trend line in this case. It seems to be following the trend of the oval that you see there. And in fact, the axes are scaled in such a way that one standard deviation of the x values is this distance. Looks like it's around uh, three and a half inches or so. There's one standard deviation of the x's, looking at the scale down here. If x increases by one of its standard deviations, along that red line, y goes up by one of its standard deviations. You know, these are heights of man. The standard deviations of x and y in these cases are probably pretty close to the same. Is that three and a half, I guess? Yeah, that looks like it might be about three and a half for the standard deviation of the y's. So in this case, they're the same, though in general they might be different. In fact, I'll show you another picture here in a minute where they're different. So again, along the red line, if you follow that red line and go from this point to this point, x increases by one standard deviation, y increases by one standard deviation. That's why it's called the SD line, and that seems like a better indicator of the trend. That's not what the regression line is, okay? Even though we often call it the trend line, and even though the spreadsheet calls it the trend line. It's not technically the same as this SD line. Um, the green line here, that's the regression line. 
a one standard deviation increase in x along the regression line corresponds to y increasing by less, it increases by this much instead of that much. About half as much. Probably the correlation here is about 0.5. I can tell that just by looking at the picture because this distance here is about half this distance. Y is changing by about one half of its standard deviations based on what that equation says. So I'm guessing R is pretty close to 0.5 right there. Here's another example. Focus on this one here. Here this scale is height in inches and this one's weight in pounds. So these are different scales with different standard deviations. The mean of the x's, the mean of the heights is around 70. What's one standard deviation for the x's? I'm, I don't know for sure. Let me just pretend it's 3. So we increase x by one standard deviation. That's 3 inches. Let's just say it's 3 inches. What's one standard deviation for the y's? Here's the mean of the y's right around 165 for the weight. Maybe one standard deviation for the weight is the distance between these two. Shift it up to go one standard deviation above the mean. About 30 might be one standard deviation for the y's. So along this dashed line, which is the SD line in this case, once again, a one standard deviation increase in x of three inches corresponds to, on the SD line, a one standard deviation increase in y about 30 pounds, from 165 to 195 or so. That's what the dashed line is. The dark line is the regression line. It's got a smaller slope, a one standard deviation increase in x corresponds to a smaller increase in y. Uh, this distance is opposed to that one. Looks like the correlation here is close to a half as well, maybe a little bit bigger than a half. Because this change in y is a little bit more than halfway to this change in y. What the regression line is really doing, what you're really after is for any given value of x, like 73 inches, look at all these coordinates. These are all the men whose height was 73 inches, the nearest inch. They have a bunch of different weights. What's the mean of those weights? That's supposed to be the second coordinate of that point in the regression line, about 180 or so. That's what the regression line really is doing best, is it's estimating the mean of the y's for any given x, for all the points with that same given x. Okay? Subtle distinctions, and when, you're, uh, when your points are real close to a straight line, when the trend is real strong, there's really not much difference between the regression line and, and SD line, which looks more like a trend line. You can't really tell the difference between them. So even though the spreadsheet calls it a trend line, it's really a regression line, which is slightly different, but it doesn't really make much of a practical effect. Okay? They're basically the same when it's a real strong trend. The graph on the left, um, you don't see a super strong cloud trend, so to speak. This is the regression line here. Once again, for any given educational level, what's the mean? income level. For people who finish college, 16 years of schooling, this is supposed to be the mean of their income level, the second quarter to that point, which is going to be around $20,000, which is not very uh, good, it seems. This is probably pretty old data. Okay, just found that graph online. $20,000, that would have been a lot of money back about 40 years ago, not so much today. I wanted to talk more about the sophomore slump. Um, I would encourage you to look at that spreadsheet and look at these graphs to really see what I meant by sophomore slopes. But because we're short on time today, I'm going to skip over it once again. I do want to spend a little more, more time talking about why it's called the least squares line. Let's go to the um, spreadsheet. Uh, let's see. I should have opened this up, but I forgot to. We're looking at the data about, let's look at the one about the price of coffee that we were looking at last time. So again, here we have X is the price, cent, price in cents per pound, the going price of coffee. Y is the percent deforestation, and this is supposed to be in Indonesia. I'm assuming they've gathered these data correctly. We calculated various things like the means of these variables, their standard deviations, the correlation, the squared correlation, the slope and the intercept. And we also continued and calculated some things over here, ultimately getting towards this quantity called SSE. And what I emphasized at the end of class, or near the end of class, I think last time, 
is why regression lines are called least squares lines. The idea is you, you want to minimize SSE, make it as small as possible. SSE stands for sum of squares of errors, errors being synonymous with the residuals. Here are those errors or residuals right there. Here are the squares. You add them up, you get this sum of squares. You want to make that as small as possible. All I want to illustrate today is that it is as small as possible. So if I go back and change the slope and intercept slightly even, this number over here should not go down, it should go up. Because that slope and that intercept are guaranteed to make SSE as small as possible. So I'll go back over here. Let, well, let's write down what this number is on the board for that many decimal places. SSE for this example. That's an approximation, I'm sure. 0.301888 Let me go ahead and change the slope and intercept. Let me not use the formulas, but instead just pick numbers. Pick whatever I feel like and see what happens to SSE. I'm going to pick two numbers that are close to these numbers, but not exactly equal. I think I'll pick 0 0.05 and point, negative 0.98. How about that? SSE won't change much, but I'm, I'm counting on the theory being right and it going up, not going down. Okay? So if I make these numbers slightly different, not following the formulas, but instead just sort of guessing, 0 0.05 and negative point, I forgot what it was. Well, there it is. I wrote it down. Negative 0.98. Let's see what happened to SSE. Everything gets updated. 0.5591. Yeah, it got bigger. By quite a bit, actually. More than I expected. Bigger than that. Even though I only changed the slope and intercept a little bit. Where did I forget my negative sign? Where did intercept? Oh, I forgot it. No, I kept the negative sign. Okay. Yeah, I didn't change them that much. And SSE got significantly bigger. Okay? Even if I had made the changes smaller, SSE would have gotten bigger. Okay? Is this important for you? Okay? I think it's important to just realize what it's doing. I could test you on this idea. I'm not going to, just in terms of knowing the idea, maybe like with a true false or multiple choice question, uh, you're not going to have homework where you have to test this. Okay? It's, it is a good thing to know the idea. You might wonder why minimize these SSEs. Uh, and I said the short answer the other day. The short answer is basically because it makes the math as nice as possible. Okay? It's a reasonable thing to do to try to minimize the sums of the squares of those errors to make that as small as possible in this picture as a way of overall matching the trend as well as possible. And it produces nice formulas. Some other line, like a line like this, definitely SSE is not minimized. If you calculate all the sums of the squares of the errors, well, they'd all be negative if the line was up here, but you're squaring those anyway. There are a bunch of longer distances. When you square them, you're going to get bigger numbers. Okay? So again, this line is chosen to minimize the sum of the squares of these distances right there. I do want you to know that basic fact. All right, going on. Um, let me skip some slides here about parameters, population, statistics, and samples. Uh, these are very important things to know, and we'll be talking about them very consistently. Let me move on to the sampling distribution. In fact, I got this slide off the course website. Here's a definition of the sampling distribution. It's worth writing down, okay, I think. The sampling distribution of a statistic, emphasis on the word statistic, not a parameter. Should have brought my ruler up here, huh? Of a statistic is the distribution of values taken by the statistic in all possible samples of the same size from the same population. So you got a population of people, say. Now let's go ahead and think about the book's example that I talked about at the end of class last time where 60% of the population went out to eat at a restaurant in the last week. Okay? So you're pretending you know the population proportion, P, we call it, is 0.6. Okay? 
Maybe you got, maybe you're thinking about all adults in the entire country, however many there are, 200 million or something. 60% of them, <laughs> let's just pretend exactly, went out to eat, eat in the last week. You could, continue, you could take simple random samples, SRS stands for simple random samples, of the same size, say 100, from that population over and over and over again, okay? Theoretically at least. Practically speaking, it's a difficult thing to take simple random samples from an entire humongous population, right? How you find people, you gotta, you gotta interview them, that costs money and time, that kind of thing. But pretend, okay, this is theoretical. Pretend you can take simple random samples. Just like you did with your table of random digits, for any given simple random sample, you can calculate a sample proportion called p hat. It's got a hat above it. That's a statistic. Anytime you put a little hat above something in statistics, in the class statistics, it represents something you're trying to estimate. p hat is supposed to estimate p. But different samples give you different values. 0.56, 56%, 0.46, 46%, 0.61, 61%, etc. You can do that over and over and over again, get a bunch of different values for p hats. You can make a stem plot. You can make a histogram. There it is. That histogram will tend to look bell shaped. It'll look like a normal curve, and in fact, we can follow the pattern with a normal curve. Okay, if you do this over and over and over again, maybe hundreds or thousands of times. If you take a bigger random sample, size 2,500 instead of 100, you get a distribution, a sampling distribution approximation that's taller and skinnier. Area under this curve is still 1, so it's got to be taller there. But there's less variability. Both of these, because of the random sampling, are centered on 0.6, the true population proportion. They are unbiased estimators, the p hat values. They're unbiased because of the simple random sampling. About half of them will be less than 0.6, and about half will be greater than 0.6. Exactly half? No. About. Okay. We're going to approach these ideas from a simulation perspective using the spreadsheet. And you're going to have some electronic homework related somewhat similar to this that I'm going to show you here in a minute. But you can take a theoretical approach to this stuff, too. And you can prove that if you're doing simple random sampling, that these sampling distributions are centered on the true population proportion, a parameter, for these statistics. Sampling distributions are for statistics. Statistics estimate population parameters, but because the values vary from sample to sample, you get histograms of data which are modeled by these curves. Super important topic here, okay? Again, if you really want to understand the rest of this class, you've got to get this. It's one of the hardest uh, concepts, but you've got to get it. Um, okay, so let's do some sampling. What we're going to do is we're going to sample from a population with a pro population proportion of p equals 0.6. Um, I'm going to show you how to make these graphs on a spreadsheet here in a minute. So what I do is I'm going to use a spreadsheet, and in fact I'll go ahead and show you the commands right away here. Using equals ran between and uh, ultimately something called count if as well. To help me make these graphs, what do these graphs illustrate? So I'm imagining sampling from this population of, it's a large population, I'm not going to say how big because I don't know, I'm just pretending it's really, really big. And I'm calculating the p hat essentially um, trial by trial, okay? I'm not saying I've got a sample of a certain size in this graph at least. this one. But in this graph, I just keep sampling. So the first value of p hat, based on the first trial, is up at 1. What does that mean? It means the first person I sampled did eat at a restaurant in the last week. They were somebody, using table B, who was labeled with the digit 0 through 5. Remember, 0 through 5 is 6 digits. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? 6 digits. Okay, that's what happened with the first person that I surveyed. The graph goes down to the next person. Evidently down to a half because evidently the next person did not eat out at a restaurant in the last week. They were labeled with 6, 7, 8, or 9. Four possible digits. 
The next person I asked, it went down again. This should be one third here, 0.3 repeating. Looks about right. They did not eat up. The next person I asked, the graph went up to 0.5 it looks like, right there. Two out of four people, two out of the four, first four people said they ate out. After five, it went up to 0.6, three fifths. Three out of the first five people said they ate all last week, 60%, just like the population parameter. Then the next person said no, the next person said no, then yes, then no, then yes, then no, maybe two no's in a row there. The number of yeses in a row, I don't know, a couple no's in a row, yes, no, yes, no. Okay, this graph is going up and down a lot because of the variability, the randomness in who I'm asking. But because the true population proportion is 0.6, the graph ultimately settles toward 0.6. Right about there, that's what it's ultimately heading toward. It's kind of a limiting type of process. This is a graph of a histogram that's an approximation to the sampling distribution, or actually the shape of it, because the scale is a uh, frequency, not a relative frequency. But it's not a perfectly symmetric curve because of this outlier here, but it's, it's almost symmetric. It's close to being centered on 0.6, though not exactly. It's only an approximation to the true sampling distribution. I got the spreadsheet to count how many times for each sample the p hat value was in each of these intervals. And I think, again, the default is, for example, if the p hat comes out to be exactly 0.6, I think it puts it in the next interval right, right there. I think that's the default, though I didn't check it. Let's go ahead and illustrate this process on a spreadsheet. You will be doing the same process with a different problem. All right, I'm going to be sampling from the population with p equal to 0.6. You're going to be doing a coin flipping simulation. So listen carefully here. Okay, so um, I got this column labeled trial number. Essentially, this one represents asking the first person. The two represents asking the second person, did you eat out in the past week? The third is the third person, the fourth is the fourth person, et cetera. How many people do I ask here ultimately? It's a sample of size 100. Okay? I said one command we're going to use is rand between, which is actually a command I just discovered this morning. Okay? I've always been using rand before, but this is a pretty convenient thing. Rand between, what does it give us? It um, returns a uniformly random integer between the two values, the low and the high, inclusive, and meaning including the numbers. So if I've got 10 people, say labeled 1 through 10 instead of 0 through 9, that'll be more natural here. If I put a 1 comma 10, it's going to give me a random whole number between 1 and 10. Why am I doing that? Again, the population proportion is 0.6 or 60%. I can just use one digit to represent sampling. So one of 10 digits to represent sampling. Oh, that right. one this time, digits numbers 1 through 6 are going to represent people who ate out last week, and numbers 7 through 10 are going to represent people who did not. I shifted it from 0 to 9 to 1 to 10. Uh, evidently, the first one's going to be a 3. It's not fun. So that's somebody who, oh no, I changed it to 10. That's somebody who did not eat out last week. Copy and paste. They always change. I don't know if you can turn that off to make them not always change, but it's in general actually a good thing. Copy and paste this all the way down. Here we go to the hundredth person. Get a bunch of whole numbers between 1 and 10. That person ate out in the last week. That person didn't. That person didn't. This person did. This person did, this person did, this person did not, this person did, this person did. We're going 1 through 6 for people who ate, ate out, 7 through 10 for people who did not. This person did, this person did, etc. We can calculate, we can keep track of a cumulative number who ate out last week by using another command called equals count if. What is equals count if going to do? It's going to count the numbers in a certain range that satisfy a certain condition. I'm after the people who ate out. I'm looking for numbers that are between 1 and 
to 6 or less than or equal to 6. Um, let's see here. Did this beforehand. I think with this first one, I just picked C2. I count that as somebody who ate out. If I put a comma here and then in quotes, I put less than or equal to 6. That's going to count that person as somebody who ate out if it's less than or equal to 6. It's going to return a 1 when it's less than or equal to 6. It's a 3 there now, so I guess this is reproducing a 1 here initially. It'll return a 0 if the person did not eat out if they were 7, 8, 9, or 10 there. That's what this function is going to do. However, if I enter it, probably that number is going to change. So it's possible this number could become a 0 instead of a 1. Yep, it changed. 8 on the left, so that's a person who did not, not eat out, and so we get a 0. To make use of that in the other cells, I don't want to type it in the exact same way in the other cells. Initially, I can type the same thing. However, if I want to keep track of a cumulative number of people who ate out in the last week, I'm also going to have to add the preceding cumulative amount, which is in the previous cell, D2. See what I did there? Zoom in. So I did equals count if C3 is less than or equal to 6. So if that number stayed at 10, you get another 0. If it was 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, or 6, you get a 1 here. But then I'm going to add the preceding number, the previous cumulative amount, to keep adding and adding as I go down. That's the idea. And we'll see that it works. You just have to mimic it. I, I would encourage you to think about why it works. Here we got a 1 first because that person was a 1 which is less than or equal to 6. Then we got a 2 here, because this one was less than or equal to 6. Again, when I copy and paste, everything changes, but let's go all the way down and see that things changed appropriately. Ah. Here we go. So now with the changes, this first person ate out, we got a 1. The second person did not eat out, this stayed at a 1. Third person did not, this stays at a 1. Fourth person did not, this stays at a 1. The fifth person did. This gets updated to 2. The sixth person did. This gets updated to 3, etc. I can convert those to percentages, proportions, by dividing by the trial number. So in this last column, cumulative proportion instead of cumulative number, I'm going to take what's in the number column, which was D2 in this case, and divide by the trial number, which was in column what? B? Yeah, B2. D2. So when that first one's a 1, I'm going to get 1 divided by 1 is 1. If the first one's a 0, I'm going to get 0 divided by 1 is 0. In the next one, it's going to divide by 2, so I'll either get 0, 0.5, or 1. In the next one, it's going to divide by 3, so I'll either get 0, 0.3333.66666 or 1. In the next one, you divide by 4, so I'll either get 0, 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or 1, etc. I keep dividing by the trial number. And I think we go to what? Row 101, I'm stopped. Go to row 101. And the last one turns out to be exactly 0 0.6, that's just coincidence though it should be close to 0 0.6, 60 out of 100 were uh, people who ate out in the last week. 60 there, which is 60 divided by 100, which is 0.6. And then I can make essentially like a time series graph for these things, though I, I found it actually worked better if you, in making your graph, if you highlight both the trial number as well as the cumulative proportion, so highlight column B and do a control, move over to column E here. Highlight those. I'm holding control down as I do this. Then go to insert, chart. Uh, that's not the kind of graph you want, but if you change the chart to being a line graph and also add, click on this thing, it's hard to see there, it says use column B as labels, it's the last button here, you see where my cursor is. Click on that, that's the kind of graph we want. And then we can label. 
Right? I think for the sake of time, I'm not going to do the other kind of graph that I wanted to make. I want to make a histogram that's going to model the sampling distribution as well. But since we're short on time because of our technology difficulties today, I'll skip that. So at the moment, I think we'll take the quiz. And then we'll talk about some other things. Okay. 